Welcome to the Cabildo. My name is Eileen Tomzuk and I'm the Education Coordinator at the Louisiana State Museum in New Orleans. The Cabildo is one of the most important sites in Louisiana history. A government building has stood here for 300 years through French, Spanish, and American rule. This building has been here since 1799. The story of the Cabildo shows how government powers in Louisiana changed over time and how the people here either supported or challenged those powers. This tour will take you through European colonial history in Louisiana, as well as the Louisiana Purchase. We will then explore the uses of the Cabildo through the 1800s, including its time as a prison, a police station, a city hall, and as the Louisiana Supreme Court. You will learn how the events here shaped the city of New Orleans, the state of Louisiana, and the United States of America. Throughout the tour, we'll provide discussion questions. When you see a slide that looks like this, feel free to pause the video and take time to discuss with your class before resuming the tour. The questions will also be provided in a full list at the end of the video. First, we'll talk about the indigenous people of this area and the arrival of Europeans. Indigenous peoples lived on this area of high ground along the Mississippi River for thousands of years. Many called it Bulbancha, which is a Choctaw word meaning a place of many languages. The area's access to the Mississippi River and to the Gulf of Mexico through Bayou St. John, Lake Pontchartrain, and Lake Bjorn made this a very popular spot for gathering and trading. The Native American tribes in this area adapted many technologies to the climate and the landscape. Native Americans in this area today still practice many of the social customs, religious beliefs, and artistic traditions that their communities have practiced for generations. Here is a list of the many Native American tribes that lived in Louisiana. In 1682, French explorer Robert Cavalier de La Salle explored the Mississippi River for France. He claimed all lands drained by the Mississippi River for France and named them Louisiane after King Louis XIV of France. However, he did not set up a permanent French settlement at this time. French-Canadian brothers Iberville and Bienville explored the Lower Mississippi in 1699. They set up a permanent settlement on the Gulf Coast near present-day Biloxi. This stone is known as the Iberville Stone, and some believe it's the founding stone laid by the brothers at this settlement. Indigenous people showed Bienville this site along the Mississippi River that they called Bulbancha, and Bienville chose it as the site for the city of New Orleans in 1718. Why did access to the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico make this an attractive spot for Native Americans and French colonists? This map from 1720 shows some of the Native American tribes that lived in this region. European colonists negotiated different relationships with different Native American tribes. While some tribes traded with colonists, others fought to defend their lands. Many Native Americans were enslaved, killed, or pushed off their land. The forced relocation of tribes accelerated after the United States gained control of Louisiana in 1803. Today, while at least 18 tribes still reside in Louisiana, the Chittimacha tribe is the only one that still lives on a section of their original homeland. What do you think caused conflict between Native Americans and European colonists? Next, We'll talk about the history of this site during the colonial period under French and Spanish rule. As early as 1721, the French mapped the center of the city as the Place d'Armes, the cathedral, the church rectory, and a government building. These areas would become Jackson Square, St. Louis Cathedral, the Presbytere, and the Cabildo today. The square provided a central gathering place for the new colonists, that was overlooked by government, military, and religious buildings. The French plan to place a government building on the location of the present-day Cabildo was the beginning of this site's government history, which has lasted almost 300 years. The French controlled New Orleans and Louisiana until 1762. They hoped that this would be a profitable colony. However, establishing the colony relied on bringing enslaved people from Africa, enslaving the local indigenous communities, and shipping vagrants and criminals from France. Therefore, much of the population was here against their will. Maintaining law and order and staying in control was very important to the wealthy French colonists who were here. To that end, they built a military prison and a military police station on this site in 1730. It was rebuilt in 1751. 
The French police station was known as the Corps de Garde. The five arched windows along St. Peter Street on the present day Cabildo are in the same location as the five windows on the French Corps de Garde from 1751. Why do you think the French built a police station and prison at the center of their new city? What purposes do these institutions serve? France ceded Louisiana to Spain in 1762. They wanted to thank Spain for their involvement in the Seven Years' War between France and Britain. They also wanted to keep Louisiana out of British hands. But Spain did not send someone to govern Louisiana until 1766. When the Spanish governor Ulloa arrived, the French residents rebelled. They held a convention in this very square in 1768, rejecting Spanish rule and demanding Governor Ulloa's removal. Governor Ulloa, fearing for his life, fled to Havana, Cuba. This plaque commemorates the French residents' attempt to reject Spanish rule. In 1769, Spain sent Governor O'Reilly to take control of Louisiana. This time, he was backed by 2,600 men and warships. His ship docked on the Mississippi River, directly across from the Place d'Armes, and then Louisiana was firmly within Spain's control. Why do you think the French residents rebelled against Spanish rule? This public square was called Place d'Armes by the French and Plaza de Armas by the Spanish. Literally translating to Weapons Square, it was used for military drills and parades. It was also the site for important celebrations or even public executions, all of which were used to demonstrate the government's power and might. Public executions were held in the Place d'Armes in the 18th and 19th centuries. They were warnings to anyone who might break the law or challenge the government's authority. Executions were particularly used to threaten and control Black and Indigenous communities. Jean Saint-Malo escaped from slavery. He started a community in the swamps for others who fled from bondage, known as Maroons. The Spanish authorities arrested Saint-Malo and the town council ordered his execution in this square in 1784. The square was a place to display the government's power, but as demonstrated by the French rebellion in 1768, it was also a place where residents gathered to challenge that power. How does the historic use of the Place d'Armes differ from the way Jackson Square is used today? Are any of its uses the same? Now we'll learn about the first Cabildo and the current Cabildo. Spanish Governor O'Reilly built the first Cabildo in 1769. It housed the, count the rooms for the Spanish Town Council, a police station, and a prison. The word cabildo is actually the Spanish word for town council. The Spanish called the building, where the cabildo met, the Casa Capitular, which means capital house. The first cabildo was destroyed by the New Orleans fires of 1788 and 1794. The cabildo that you see today was built between 1795 and 1799. It also contained chambers for a town council, a police station, and a prison. Many of these same functions would continue after the United States of America gained control of New Orleans and Louisiana. This map shows the area of New Orleans that was destroyed or heavily damaged by the Great Fire of 1788. As you can see, the first Cabildo building was included in the area of the blaze. The current Cabildo was built from 1795 to 1799. This print, from 1845, shows how the Cabildo, St. Louis Cathedral, and the Presbyter appeared before the major renovations in the mid-1800s. Let's talk about the Louisiana Purchase. In 1803, three different nations governed Louisiana, Spain, France, and the United States. Spain had secretly ceded Louisiana back to France in the year 1800, but Spanish rule continued here until 1803. By then, Napoleon had already agreed to sell Louisiana to the United States for $15 million. On November 30th, 1803, a ceremony took place right here in the Sala Capitular in the Cabildo, transferring Louisiana officially from Spain back to France. Just 20 days later, on December 20th, 1803, France transferred Louisiana to the United States of America, and the American flag was hoisted outside the Cabildo. This painting depicts the Louisiana Purchase Transfer Ceremony in front of the Cabildo. 
The illustrator painted this in 1902, nearly 100 years after the ceremony took place. Though the artist was not alive at the time of the ceremony, the painting still gives you some idea of how the Cabildo and Jackson Square may have looked in 1803. A flagpole stood at the center of the Place d'Armes, where a statue of Andrew Jackson now stands. The painting shows how the square was used for military demonstrations and public gatherings. The Cabildo had only two stories and a flat roof, as shown here. The third story and cupola were added in 1847. This painting also shows how St. Louis Cathedral appeared before it was renovated in the mid 1800s. This map from 1912 shows the area of the Louisiana Purchase. The United States wanted to acquire Louisiana because the country wanted access to the Mississippi River and the Port of New Orleans. Just like the French colonists and the Native American tribes before them, the United States knew New Orleans was an excellent location for trade. The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States of America. Why do you think the Louisiana Purchase is such an important event in the history of the United States? Now we'll talk about how the Cabildo was used after it was built in 1799. Many of the uses of this building under Spanish colonial rule continued after the Louisiana Purchase. This room is the Sala Capitular, or Council Chambers. Government officials have met in this room for more than a century and made decisions that affected the city, state, and the country. Until 1803, the Cabildo, or the Spanish Town Council, met here. The appointed members managed city, of, city affairs and ruled on civil and criminal cases. The Cabildo touched all aspects of public life, from maintaining law and order to managing public entertainment. They even owned a public dance hall. The Cabildo addressed issues such as public health, crime, inheritance, and more. This image shows how the Sala Capitular may have looked around 1800, while it was used by the Spanish Cabildo. Enslaved individuals had the right to purchase freedom under Spanish rule. This process was known as coatacion. 384 enslaved persons were able to purchase their own freedom, and another 406 obtained freedom through third-party funds in this way. Coatacion was protected by law, but enslaved individuals had to raise the necessary funds and faced possible retaliation from enslavers. Juanita was one enslaved woman of color who pursued this path to freedom. This handwritten record shows that the Cabildo considered Juanita's petition for freedom on October 11, 1800. Under American rule, self-purchase became increasingly restricted and was no longer a right for all enslaved people. From 1803 until 1852, this building served as New Orleans City Hall. The American New Orleans City Council also met in these chambers until City Hall moved to Gallier Hall in 1852. Members of the American City Council were elected rather than appointed. They had the power to make laws, regulate policing, and impose taxes. The City Council also approved adding the third floor mansard roof and cupola to the Cabildo in 1847, which are seen here. Do you know who serves on your City Council today? How do you think their role is similar to or different from the city council that served here in the Cabildo? From 1853 until 1908, these chambers served as the house of the Louisiana Supreme Court. Many important court cases were decided here. This photograph shows five justices of the Louisiana Supreme Court sometime between 1892 and 1904. The justice seated at the center is Governor Francis Nichols, who presided over the famous case of Homer Plessy. Homer Plessy was a Creole man of African and European descent who challenged racial segregation. In 1892, he sat in a whites-only rail car on behalf of an activist group called the Citizens Committee. He was arrested and found guilty by Judge John Howard Ferguson of violating the Separate Car Act. Plessy and his attorneys challenged the constitutionality of this act in front of the Louisiana Supreme Court. They upheld Ferguson's earlier decision. Then, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, which legalized segregation. The U.S. Supreme Court did not end legal segregation until Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. Despite the efforts of activists like Homer Plessy, the results of that case allowed segregation to continue for decades. 
For example, this sign hung in the Municipal Auditorium in New Orleans in the 1950s, marking a section open only to white people. Another memorable case that took place here was the longest case in U.S. history. The woman in this photograph, Myra Clark Gaines, filed suit in 1834, arguing she was her father's legal heir. At this time, women could not sue, and judges often refused to hear women testify. She received national attention for her determined pursuit of justice. Her case lasted 54 years. The court ruled in her favor in 1889, which was four years after her death. Women, enslaved individuals, and free people of color could not serve on the Spanish Cabildo, the American New Orleans City Council, or the Louisiana Supreme Court in the 19th century. As we saw in the experiences of Juanetta, Homer Plessy, and Myra Clark Gaines, people who are blocked from holding power often tried to work through the system to achieve their goals, with mixed results. How might these historic power imbalances affect New Orleans, even today? Do you think any Louisiana residents do not have access to positions of power today? The Cabildo also held the mayor's offices. The rooms behind me served as the mayor's parlor and offices while New Orleans was City Hall until 1852. Sixteen different New Orleans mayors served in these offices. Many mayors instituted important public works in the city. For example, Mayor Count Louis Philippe de Raffignac advocated for street paving, street lighting, and improving the sanitary conditions of the city. Mayor William Ferret helped institute the first public school system in New Orleans. A police station was located on the first floor of the Cabildo. This room served as a police station from 1799 until 1914. It's the oldest room in the Cabildo. It actually incorporates the old brick walls of the original French police station, known as the Corps de Garde, built in 1751. A racially integrated police force called the Metropolitan Police was started after the American Civil War. Their headquarters were here in the Cabildo. The arsenal is immediately behind the Cabildo on St. Peter Street. This building, the arsenal, was built in 1839 to hold the state's weapons. Residents, police, and soldiers fought for control of the arsenal and the Cabildo several times after the American Civil War during the period known as Reconstruction. Many former Confederates and their sympathizers were angry about losing power to black residents and their white allies after the American Civil War. They formed groups that tried to take over the Reconstruction government by force. In the 1872 Louisiana governor's race, opponents of Reconstruction supported candidate John McEnery. They refused to recognize William Pitt Kellogg as the new governor, and they opposed the racially integrated Metropolitan Police, who were headquartered in the Cabildo. In 1873, a group of McEnery supporters attacked the Metropolitan Police in Jackson Square. They failed to overthrow the government and the police, but unrest continued. In 1874, a group of white supremacists calling themselves the Crescent City White League waged battle against the Metropolitan Police in the Battle of Liberty Place at the foot of Canal Street. Afterwards, they occupied the Cabildo and the Arsenal, and President Ulysses S. Grant had to send federal troops to restore order. Then, in 1877, after another disputed governor's race, this time between Stephen Packard and Francis T. Nichols, 3,000 men supporting Nichols descended upon the Cabildo. They ousted the Metropolitan Police and the Supreme Court Justices. This event was the informal end of Reconstruction in Louisiana. A prison was located behind the Cabildo, separated by a courtyard. Since 1730, every building complex on this site has included a prison. These cells were built in the 1850s and used until the early 1900s. The prison cells here were often crowded, filthy, and overrun with rats. Archaeological evidence tells us that prisoners passed the time by gambling with pottery shards or marbles. This courtyard separated the law makers from the law breakers. People could be imprisoned for vagrancy, theft, or violent crime, but others, other prisoners were simply enslaved individuals who had tried to run for their freedom. Notice the iron bars that remain on the windows, which helped prevent prisoners from escaping. The privateer and smuggler Pierre Lafitte was imprisoned here in 1814. He managed to escape. 
The city offered a $1,000 reward, as seen in this newspaper ad, but he was never caught. Pierre and his brother, famed pirate Jean Lafitte, earned pardons by assisting the Americans in the Battle of New Orleans. Enslaved people courageously resisted bondage in many ways, including running for their freedom. If captured, they could be put in jail. This newspaper ad from 1837 describes Malie, a 24-year-old woman who spoke French and English and escaped from her enslaver. The ad offers a reward of $10 for capturing Malie and taking her to jail. How did prisons, such as this one, help maintain power structures, such as that between people who were enslaved and their enslavers? Let's look back at what we learned. We learned when European colonists arrived and when power changed between France, Spain, and the United States of America. We learned that this site has had many uses, including a prison, a police station, city council chambers, and home of the Louisiana Supreme Court. We also learned that many different people either enforced or challenged the government here at the Cabildo. What was the most interesting thing you learned about the Cabildo? Hanging above me are the 10 flags that have flown over the state of Louisiana, demonstrating the state's complex history. In the early 1900s, the Cabildo became the Louisiana State Museum. Today, the museum hosts programs and exhibitions that cover Louisiana's history and culture. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you can plan a future visit to the Cabildo.